message that I am going to try and share with you is outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. Hello and welcome back for the final time in the teaching series, The Jesus That John Me. Uh, we've now reached literally, I think, the last episode, which is 114 in, I think, in the series now. And so we're just going to just look at this last scene that I just want to bring to you. Uh, and we'll unpack that and then we'll draw the series to a close. And may I just say thank you so much for, uh, for, for staying the distance. I really enjoyed teaching the series and uh, I've been so encouraged by the feedback and the comments that I've had from those of you who have been following. So thank you very, very much. Bless you. And I hope today is a, is a helpful uh, finale for you. So we're in John chapter 21, and here we are in verse 15. Uh, You'll remember, won't you, last week we had this amazing scene of of Jesus uh, having breakfast with the disciples after what is, you know, was a momentous moment, and we learned something important about coming to fullness through emptiness. And we'd seen our our, our would-be heroes had been in a situation whereby uh, they fished all night and gained nothing whatsoever. And now Jesus had come and and brought to them this wonderful news. Um, And then we have this really interesting scene that follows after the 15th verse. It says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And the minute you're left with the, the question, more than what, you know, uh, what, 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 was, was Peter maybe so enamoured by this supernatural ability to catch fish? Had, had Peter suddenly thought to himself, wow, this is it, this is the way to fame and fortune. Look at this, we, we fished all night, we gathered nothing, but now we found this incredible secret. This, you've no idea what I'm going to tell the TV chat shows when I get to talk to them about this. You've never seen nothing like this. We, they, they discovered the, the, the greatest secret of all. You know, you've been, can you imagine? You, you, they, they've been out wading around in the deeps and the depths of the night and had found nothing. And now here in daylight, in the shallow waters, they found everything they needed. Uh, and perhaps as yet, it hasn't quite dawned on Peter. And it really won't do until the other side of Pentecost. And even the other side of Pentecost, it, they, they, you were going to see that the disciples are slow to catch on to this. But maybe what Jesus had introduced them to was the way of the mystic. You see, when you've toiled all night long, and, and we all know what that means, don't we? And you've found nothing. The idea that, uh, the, the, the mystic idea is that says, look, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor do they reap. They don't gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. I mean, what does that do to the whole doctrine of tithing, for example? My goodness me, I can hear people scrambling for Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, urgently going through it to see what that says. But but you know what? Listen, understand something. When you hear those people talk to you about those ridiculous ideas that God's going to bless you if you do and God's going to get you if you don't, and the whole notion of you're robbing God, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, Oh, they couldn't be more wrong. Let me tell you something, my dear friends. If you, it's not, if you tithe under the law, or let me rephrase that, if you do not tithe under the law, it's not that you are robbing God by not tithing. Let me tell you something much more important. You're being robbed of God if you do tithe. Because if you tithe as a principle in order to get, you are being robbed of the mystical journey that is our divine life of provision in Christ. Look at the birds of the air, Jesus says. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, they don't do any of it. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Uh, consider the lilies of the field, Jesus says to them. Look at them. They, they, look, they, what do they do? Look how they grow. They don't, they don't toil, they don't spin. My goodness, how much of your life and how much of my life has been spent toiling and spinning? They don't toil, they don't spin, <clears throat> they don't do anything like that. Yet the truth is, even Solomon, in all his glory, wasn't arrayed as one of these. Hmm. Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon's response was to say, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. What is, what's going on 
what's the, what's the discussion that's taking place? Um, what's Peter saying? Does he feel that he, he's kind of got to prove his love for Jesus all over again? Does he, but surely he knows that Jesus must love him. And so Jesus just says to him, Peter, feed my lambs. Notice he doesn't say, feed my sheep. He says, feed my lambs. And I wonder if he's speaking to us about spiritual babes. I wonder if Peter can yet carry across the conversation from Luke where Jesus said to him, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you, but I have prayed, and when you have returned, strengthen the brothers. I mean, this is this, is this point. This is this point of feeling again. And so he says here to him in the, in, in the second, 16th verse, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes. Lord, do you know that I love you? And he said to him, tend my sheep. Feed my sheep, tend my sheep. Now watch. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said it to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything and you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Well, three times Peter is asked, Simon, son of Joe, do you love me? I wonder, I, it's not the case, but it's quite an interesting idea that uh, where the Greek can intensify in the degree of love. It's a nice idea, but I don't think it's the point. The, the, Jesus is saying, Peter, do you agape me? Do you, is it me and you and you and me? And, 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 and is this who we are now? Peter says, you know I love you. And Peter starts to become progressively uneasy, progressively uncomfortable, uh, to the point, I think, where at the end he becomes actually quite, quite wounded. You know, what, what is Jesus saying? Are you, are you suggesting that I don't love you? How could you, after all you've been through, how, how could you suggest that I don't love you? I wonder if there's any sense here where Jesus is saying to him, Peter, let me just undo the damage that you did. For surely three times you denied me, didn't you? And here we now have three affirmations to counsel the three denials. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. Feed my lambs. Do you love me? Tend to my lambs. Do you love me? Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Verse 18, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress and carry you where you want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. And I think this is such an important um, statement. And it's an important statement for us as it was an important statement for Peter because Jesus is saying to him, look, when all is said and done, Peter, just follow me. And there can be no greater advice to you and I that we, you know, when all is said and done, we just need to follow. Follow wherever it may take us, wherever the wrong road would go, just follow. Yet none go with me, I still will follow. Remember we've seen that song when we were growing up in church, trust and obey, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. <laughs> But watch what happens next. Peter is reaffirmed. Peter is reinstated, if you like. Peter is, it kind of feels as though he's, he's back in the game, almost. And then Jesus does something very strange. Peter turned and, and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who had been reclining at the table close to him and said, the one who said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, What about this man? And Jesus said to him, If it's my will that he remain until I come, what is it to you? You follow me. So the same spread abroad uh, among the brothers that the disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say that he wasn't to die. He simply said, If he, if he, what is it to you if I leave him to remain until I come? What is the matter with us? Peter has got his instructions. Peter has been given his assurances. Peter has been given his comfort. 
and yet he can't satisfy himself in that. He can't quite settle himself in that. And so we get right to the end of the book of John, right to the end of the gospel, right to the end of this three and a half year journey that has taken them hither and thither. It's taken them on every twist and turn. It's taken them through uh, the feeding of the 5,000, walking on the water, through the raising of the dead, uh, through, through turning water into wine. This incredible odyssey, this grace odyssey, up and down, here and there, to the cross and back, up from the grave. And yet still, at the end of this whole process, Peter wants to know, well, what about him? This, this great stumbling block of sibling rivalry, this great problem with the performance gospel, this great problem that we always think we need to, we're missing something, we need to add something, or someone's getting something we're not. And, and Peter's question seems to me to come from the very deepest depths of our insecurity. What about this man? There's this fear, isn't there, of being left behind. There's this, 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 and this fear of being overlooked, this fear of being passed over, is the greatest inhibitor to intimacy in Christ. It's the greatest inhibitor to our going deeper. And yet, and yet Peter's stuck there somehow. Peter's stuck. And it's such a shame because it's become so much part of our culture. Why do we feel we need to compete? Well, what's, the, what's the matter? Why are we worried about being left behind? Why are we worried about being forgotten? We're never going to be forgotten. We get caught up on the most strangest things in the world these days. How many friends do you have in Facebook? How many people follow you on Twitter? I mean, what's all that about? But that's the world in which we're starting to live in. And we need to be very, very careful about that. Let me read you something. If you are somebody who suffers or knows what it means to suffer from performance addictions, and I've written about that elsewhere, I won't weary you with that now. But let me read you a word of wisdom which I came across some years ago, and I was very fond of it. It seemed a lovely quote. This is from a man called Victor Frankl, in the book you probably know about. He says, Don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it your target, the more you're going to miss it. For success like happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue. And it only does so as the unintentioned side effect of one's dedication to a cause greater than oneself. Happiness must happen. And the same holds true of success. You have to let it happen by not caring about it. Jesus says, well, let me ask you something, Peter, what is it to you if it's my will that he remains until I come? What's it going to do to you? You follow me. That's all you need to worry about. And really, as we close this book, that's all anyone needs to worry about. People seem to be getting so excitable these days when we start talking about the nature of inclusion, when we start talking about the whole idea that maybe the gospel of grace is more scandalous than we ever thought. There is this immediate sense, and you're I, I seeing it more and more and more, that the, you know, the great fear is that maybe people are going to get blessed for not having done anything. Maybe people are going to find their way into heaven and they haven't paid the entry price that we think that we've had. They haven't denied the way that we think that we have and, and lived the holy lives the way that we would like to perceive that we have, and we're kind of bothered about that. We're as bothered as Jonah when he was sent down to Nineveh and refused to go because he knew so well that Jesus, the God in himself, was going to save a group of people that Jonah didn't feel were worth saving. We're like the story in the parable of the vineyard where the, the owner decides he's going to pay the same amount of wages to the one who turned up at five o'clock clocking off time to the one who came on at eight o'clock clocking on time. And we don't like it. We're not happy. There's a stirring inside of us that just can't leave that alone. And yet the simple call to us is, what's it got to do with you? Just follow me. So wherever the Lord is carrying, whatever the Lord is asking you to do, just follow. Just flow. And watch and see what will happen. It's a very beautiful life that stands before us. And it's a very important thing for Peter to hear as they are about to cross over into the New Covenant era. And then the final verse of John says this. Now there were also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Jesus did so many different things. But yet John identified seven signs and seven I am's. And those were enough 
to prove positive that there was something very, very unique about the Jesus that John knew. And I hope that uniqueness has not been wasted on you. I hope that uniqueness has been caught. That you could too live in the power and live by the grace and live through the life of the Jesus that John knew. God bless you. Bye-bye. believe God? How many of us truly believe God? Or how many of us in our darker moments, in our moments are where, where the of, of credit crunch, in our moments where life seems to crowd in on us, where our circumstances seem to overwhelm us, instead of believing God, put our trust in ourselves. You see, because the real nature of this thing, this, what this whole thing is really going to be about when we come right down to the wire is, I know you believe in God, but do you believe God? Do you believe that God will do what he said he'll do? Because if you believe, you will wait. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Because I know that many of you have got faith to believe for other people. I know that many of you believe that God will come through for the other person. I know that many of you believe that God's going to come through for somebody else in the church. But you don't believe God's going to come through for you. But you are the seed of Abraham. From the very womb of Sarah. And in Isaiah 51 it says, look to whom you have been hewn from.